out there in Facebook, YouTube, out in the media land, Paul Sterling here. I am a relationship, communication, and intimacy coach. I work uh, mostly with couples. Sometimes I work with singles who want to go from single to being relationship ready. So it has been a passion of mine. I've spent the last 25 years doing this thing and I don't intend to stop. So tonight I'm going to dive into uh, four main things, and I'm going to show you them. By the way, at the end of this, I'm going to tell you how you can get a copy of my book for free. What If you're really anxious, you can go right to Amazon and get my book for $19.97. It was a bestseller there on Amazon, it's called Argue Less, Love More, and it is all about relationship communication. One other quick thing before I dive in, this is interactive. Um, not as interactive as Zoom, which I would love, but it's interactive and you make comments and most of your comments I can see right away. Some of them I can't until after the call, but I always respond to them and it helps me to know someone's out there and I'm not just talking to the screen. So I would love to hear who you are, where you're calling in from, and what are some of the communication issues that you have? So what I'm gonna talk about tonight is how to have better communication for couples and how to use these tools so you can rebuild trust, rekindle intimacy, and reawaken the love. Now, if you've ever wondered why the people you love the most are often most difficult to talk to, you are not alone. So tonight we are going to dive into that and talk about how do you talk so your lover wants to listen and doesn't retreat, how to listen so your lover wants to open up and talk, how to avoid the triggers, pushing their buttons, the, the communication landmines that stop all communication in its tracks and block any chance of intimacy. And what can you do to get communication back on track after somebody is triggered? So good evening. Um, again, Paul Sterling. I am normally I'm coming to you from Harbin. Uh, well, not Harbin, but <laughs> near Harbin, uh, Napa Valley, California. And today I am on the opposite coast. I am on the East Coast in Vermont with my brother, my mother, his, my brother's wife, um, so family. And boy, I tell you, it wasn't always great when I would come back for Christmas. When my dad and my older brother were around, it, I learned a lot of things not to do when it comes to communication. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about both the things to do and the things not to do. So... Hopefully you've got a way to take pictures of some of these slides. I'm going to tell you right now what everybody wants. And I literally have clients around the world ranging from, also, well, from rocket scientists to airline pilots to um, lawyers, therapists, counselors, and I I taught this stuff in prison, so it's um, it works pretty much universally around the world. And for some reason, oh, there we go. Ah, here is what everybody wants. It took me a second to get my pen going. I was almost sweating there. Number one, and this is going to sound so simple. It really is going to sound simple. What do people want, whether it's your kids 
whether it's your lover, whether it's your parents, if you work at a job, it's your employees, it's your customers, they all want these same three things. It sounds so damn simple. They want to be heard. They want to be understood. And they want to feel valued. So what gets in the way? If it seems so simple, why is it so hard? And if you look at the planet right now, it is, people are fighting everywhere. They're fighting on Facebook. Everybody's got, the, you know, these one line that they're battling with each other. We've got war happening. We've got challenges in families. We've got the divorce rate going up because even though everybody wants these simple things to be heard, understood, and valued, very few people are getting it. So what is the biggest problem? If you think about that, number one, number two, or number three, if you could type that in, which one do you think is the biggest problem? Hearing somebody, understanding somebody, valuing somebody. What gets in the way? And is that something you want? So if that's something you want, just type in, I, I agree. And by the way, I'm going to ask you to interact, type in a lot of stuff. It makes me feel like I'm having a conversation with you. And that, if, if that happens, you're giving me a gift. All right. Number three, valued. Valerie, thank you so much. Um, and what I'm going to say from doing this for 25 years, number three is, the, is actually the outcome of doing number four. One and number two. And what normally stops people is this one right here, because we are afraid that understanding equals agreement. So Tony and Tony said it's number one. Okay. So I'm going to say they're all a little bit challenging, but the biggest one that I've seen is this one right here. People are afraid, and I notice in myself, I'm afraid if I really understand and slow down and feed it back, that somebody's going to interpret it that I, I agree with them. And you'd be amazed at how transformational the communication becomes when you use these three things, heard, understood, and valued. Now, I have taught this at Naropa University to the college professors and therapists and counselors there. And at the same time, I was teaching it to the professors. I was teaching it at the jail at Golden, Colorado, to minimum and up to maximum security inmates. So the exact same thing that I was teaching to the professors, I was teaching to the inmates. Um, the curriculum was hardly any different because we all want the same things. We want to be heard. We want to be understood. We want to be valued. If you want to have a great relationship, those three things are there. So what I'm going to go into is what goes wrong? What gets in the way? So what gets in the way is if we don't feel heard, understood, and valued, we start to get upset. And when we get upset, the harder we try, like raising our voice, and using tools and saying it in 10 different ways, the harder we try, a lot of times the worse things get. And when things start to get bad, we take it personally. How many of you raise your hand, type it in, take it personally. When your partner, your lover starts to raise their voice and maybe sound say things that are BSW, BSW. Bad, stupid, wrong. Anytime that we get told that we're bad, stupid, wrong, we get defensive, we get triggered, attack back. So here's the deal. We st start at the top, not feeling heard, understood, and valued. We start, the harder we try, the worse things get. We take things personally. We trip each other's triggers. We push each other's buttons. And bam, we're in a world where it feels like almost constant conflict. Now, if you've been on my calls before, and a lot of you have, you're going to go, this sounds similar. It is similar. And it's like if you look at any great athlete, a great athlete masters the basics. One of the most basic tools that we have in relationships is communication. 
the quality of your communication is going to affect the quality of your relationship. And when your communication falls apart, so does your relationship. So here we go. We end up with constant conflicts and that erodes trust and intimacy because you don't want to have sex with someone that doesn't listen to you, doesn't hear you, doesn't understand you, and doesn't value you. And when that happens, we end up taking days, weeks, months to recover. Now, all right, I'm going to do a, an embarrassing admission here. Oh, man, my dad was a lot of great things, and he was also somewhat of an asshole. And he was Irish and alcoholic and a recovering Catholic. And some of the things he would say growing up, it's like, if you want something to cry about, I'll give you something to cry about. Yeah. And the other thing he said, if one of the best defenses is a strong offense. And I watched him be really offensive with me, my other brothers, my mom. And it wasn't a safe place to be vulnerable. I'm going to say that again. It was not a safe place to be vulnerable. And if you want open, honest communication in your relationship with your kids, with your spouse, with anyone, it's all about creating a safe space, not a comfortable space, but a safe space to talk about anything and everything. So we're going to dive into what it takes to do that. Now, this guy here, um, his name is Marshall Rosenberg, and he is no longer with us, but I love this man. <clears throat> Getting choked up. I can think about my life before and after Marshall Rosenberg, and he is a creator of, and some of you probably know him, NBC, Nonviolent Communication, and he is an amazing person. And the interesting thing, I'm going to tell you a quick story about him, and then I'm going to go back to the quote. But I had flown to Sweden to study with Marshall, and uh, I'm sure he, we laughed about this a lot afterwards. So I had flown from, I was living in Vancouver, flew all the way to Sweden. And so I get into town, and I'm staying at the same house that Marshall is, because we're all going to go to this castle and he's going to teach this castle in Sweden. Very cool. And his girlfriend is late and they miss each other at the airport. She gets back first. He comes back second. What's this all got to do with communication? Well, when they got together, they got in this big fight. And I had just flown all the way across the world or halfway across the world to study nonviolent communication with this guy. And at some point in the middle of this upset, I interrupted and I said, geez, wouldn't it be a, this be a good place to use that nonviolent communication chip? And why I say that is there are some things that are like a transformation. Once you get it, you never go back. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. There are other things like staying physically fit that you have to keep going to the gym. I have to work out. I work out three, four times a week. I mountain bike, I do different yoga, I do different things. And it's a constant workout. What I'm about to teach you, I wish it was a transformation. It's not, it's a workout. Learning how to communicate this way, it will open up your world, but you still have to choose to use it. Here was the master, not the, the creator of nonviolent communication, the guy who traveled around the world teaching it. And there was still a day when he was arguing with his beloved and they were triggered. And they were in that downward spiral. And I'll talk more about that later. But you know, once he, once he decided to change and start using his NBC, they resolved it pretty quickly. And for years after that, Marshall and I would laugh about that, that moment. But it's always a choice. Now, what Marshall said that's so critical is the normal outcome. The normal outcome of most communication is misunderstanding. Communication is a crude and clumsy tool. 
if you went to see a doctor that said the normal outcome of this operation is death, you probably wouldn't get the operation. If you went to an attorney and said the normal outcome of most of my cases is I lose them, you wouldn't you wouldn't go use that attorney. And yet here it is, we're using communication and the normal outcome is misunderstanding. So it's important to know that. And then what do we do about that? So by the way, if you get an aha, if you have a breakthrough, if you have a question, please type it in and I can see it right here. Thank you so much. So what happens when we get it right? When we get it right, the world opens up to us. And I want you to think about your relationship. If you get it wrong, and, and I get it wrong, I still get it wrong. I've been doing this 25 years. I still have to choose to be courageous and vulnerable and use these communication tools. They become easier over time, but it's always a choice. So when you get it right, what happens is you can speak with courage, compassion, and curiosity. And both of you, even if you disagree completely about the topic, you can, both of you can feel heard, understood, and valued. And when that happens, you feel confident and safe. You know how to repair upsets. Because in almost any relationship, there are going to be upsets. There are going to be misunderstandings. Things are going to be challenging, especially nowadays. And when you have communication like that, it builds trust and it builds intimacy. And intimacy, basically, uh, there's three different shades of intimacy. I talk about this in a different one of my calls. But the three shades of intimacy are emotional intimacy, physical intimacy, and sexual intimacy. And what creates space for all three of those levels of intimacy is trust. And when you have these tools and you've developed these muscles, you can rebound in minutes instead of days, weeks, or months. And I was saying, you know, what I learned from my dad is I learned how to hold a grudge. I went through one divorce, four broken engagements. It, I was a slow learner when it comes to this. Huh. And with my ex-wife, Corrine, who I'm still good friends with, Many, many, many years later, I mean, we met, God, I was 18 or 19 years old when we met. We were together 18 years. But it's embarrassing to say I could hold a grudge for a week or two weeks, and I was trying to punish her into better behavior because to me, I would rather be a hardened bastard than be vulnerable. Now, I've changed. That's not what I teach anymore. It's not how I behave, although sometimes I still feel that way. But it's really about learning how to communicate in a totally different way. And why I'm telling you what I used to do is because I want you to think about if I can get this, almost anybody can get this. If I can teach this to maximum security inmates in a, in a prison, Almost anybody can get this. And if college professor can get this, almost anybody can get this. So this is a chance. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you everything I can right now. And at the end of this call, I'm going to tell you about a program that's coming up. If you want to do a deep dive into transforming the way you communicate, I'm going to spend six weeks with a small group of couples. And then afterwards, I'm creating an app so that you have an app on your phone in the middle of a conflict, you can press a button and it will walk you through conflict resolution. It is gonna be the coolest thing and we're working on it right now and we need a, about 10 couples to go through the beta test. So if you're interested in being one of the beta testers for this six weeks to better communication, you can type in six weeks there and I will get you the information and get you on the waiting list. All right, here we go. Here are the three things. Now, I've talked about these. I might even talk about these last week. They don't change. These problems 
don't go away. It's not like you go and get new ones. And how many of you can resonate with this? Number one, my partner doesn't listen. They don't listen. Thank you, Valerie. There's a six-weeker right there. I will get you the information. Now, the first problem, my partner doesn't listen. What's it feel like when someone doesn't listen to you? It kind of sucks. And I'm going to tell you what to do about that. The second one is they won't talk. Why won't they talk? Why have they shut down? Why has communication stopped? And some of you have done both of these. You have, um, you've been a not talker and a, um, a not listener. And then the third one is they take everything what? Personally. So it trips their triggers. It pushes their buttons. It causes them to either bounce out of the conversation or shut down. Now, the other thing you could do is you can go, ah, I, 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 I don't listen to my partner so that they feel heard, understood, and valued. I don't talk to my partner in a way that's open and honest and vulnerable. And I take everything personally and I get triggered and I pull out of the conversation. So this, can you relate to this? If you can relate this, whatever, I can relate. If you could turn those around, what would your relationship be like? If you could get people to lean in. And, and what we're going to be going through is what I call effective communication. Now, effective, that's not that sexy a name. Like over the last probably 20 years, I've been trying to find uh, some sexy name for it. And if you come up with one, let me know. Because I love Marshall and I love nonviolent communication, but that really didn't sound that good to me either. Because people say, oh, I don't communicate violently. So anyway, effective communication is what causes people to lean in versus lean out. So I'm going to ask you, when you're communicating, what do you want? Do you want your partner to, do you want your partner to lean in? Do you want connection, compassion, cooperation? Or do you want them to lean out, lean away? Do you want resistance, resentment, regret? So I know I'm I'm asking you a lot here to say something, but lean in, lean out. Which one do you want? Because I'm about to show you how to get both of those. You're about to learn a little more about how to talk so that they want to listen, how to listen so they open up and want to talk. And then this last one, how to avoid upsets and tame triggers, because there is something called the listening switch. And I'm writing that out. Now, I, I'm not a great multitasker, so listening switch. And what the listening switch does is when somebody hears BSW, bad, stupid, wrong, they hear that they're being made bad, stupid, wrong, what happens with the listening switch? It turns off. So if you want to be able to do this, let me, if you want to do this, or you want to be able to do this, what you have to do is avoid this. And I'm not talking about avoiding talking about hot topics. We'll talk about hot topics. We could talk about money, sex, family, kids, upsets, relationships, jealousy. I work with couples that have gone through affairs, broken agreements. Um, they're at the edge of divorce. And if they have the right tools, they can talk about it. So the idea is to be able to to number one, know what causes the upsets. And be, then you're not always going to be able to avoid them. Sometimes you're going to trigger your partner. 
really important to know how do you tame your triggers because once you're triggered it's like all you see is the enemy image the your partner no longer your ally you're triggered because i talk about you communicate from your head your heart or your hurt your hurt is the back here this is your reptile brain and when you're in your reptile brain all you can see is their limited decisions the world becomes like black and white and and it's like is that an enemy or an ally and the classic example of that when president bush years ago said you're either for us or against us that was crocodile brain that was animal brain talking you're either our enemy or our ally and if i've got to defend myself from you i'm going to think that you're the enemy and then you look like you're dangerous to me you're not safe and if you're not safe i'm not going to have a vulnerable conversation with you is that all making sense as soon as i've tripped the enemy trigger you're going to treat me like the enemy so here's some of the things we can do there are three things i'm going to cover and hopefully you take notes, but also what you can do is listen to the recording again and again, or you can join me for the six weeks, either way you want to do it or both. This is something like you practice all the time. If, if you, any of you are athletes or ever were athletes, the coach didn't want you at one practice a month. He wanted you at every practice or she wanted you at every practice. So. What's going to happen if you're moving from a relationship disaster to a relationship master, you need to show up at the practice. So here are some of the keys that you can use to be to get them to listen. So start with what's the purpose? And sometimes we think the purpose is to let them know how bad, stupid and wrong they are so they change their behavior. And what happens when we do that, rather than get it listening, we get resistance. And so if you just slow down and think about it, the last time you had a heated conversation, what was the outcome you really wanted? Not the one you got, but what was the one that you wanted? Oh, a lot of times you might say connection or understanding or to be heard. And so what has to happen is to create that, you need to be vulnerable. vulnerable. And one of my mentors, somebody I've interviewed on this show before, a woman, Alison Armstrong, who I love. She wrote The Queen's Code and a bunch of other books. And super amazing woman. She says, nothing great happens in a relationship until somebody gets vulnerable. And if you study a little bit of Brene Brown stuff, you can find both of them on YouTube. Brene Brown talks about vulnerability and courage are the opposite sides of the same coin. There's no courage without vulnerability and vulnerability means risk, um, uncertainty and emotional exposure. And so when you start to communicate, think about the outcome that you want. What are you committed to? Am I committed to connecting with them? Am I committed to elevating our relationship or lowering it by making them bad, stupid, wrong? Am I committed to having them lean in or pull away? So let me ask, think about an upset conversation that you've had anytime. If you thought, if you slowed down and thought about what was the purpose of the conversation, if you could have had it your way, what did you really want? And I can think back on a conversation I had when I was afraid and jealous, and I didn't do this, and it came out as an attack, like they shouldn't have done what they did, and it went miserably. Now, I can think of other conversations where I did start with this and let them even know what my intention was. That my intention is to be vulnerable, to be courageous. And I actually did that with my brother uh, 
last night sit down at the dinner, dining room table and we have we have such good conversation it's amazing and he and his wife have studied communication for years and it's so amazing to have these talks with them so if you think about it what was the purpose of the last conversation that ended up being in an upset and would it have helped if you had just taken a second and said, here's what my purpose is. All right. The second part of this is go slow to go fast. 40 words max. Now, I've told this story before too. My mother, who is actually downstairs right now, um, was, we were in, Denver and she was visiting me in Denver and she was following behind me in a car and I was driving and I know my way around Denver so I could drive really fast because I knew where I was going. The problem is she didn't know where she was going and she had to follow me. So if you want somebody to follow you in a car and I'd love for somebody to type in what do you need to do? When you get to a yellow light, what do you need to do? When you make a turn, how do you check and make sure they're behind you? So do you go fast or slow? You know where you're going. You can zip right there. So by driving faster, does that get you there faster? Or does that actually slow the whole process down? Because now my mom's lost. So what I want you to think about, when you get to a yellow light, what do you do? Slow down. When you make a turn, what do you do? You check your rear view mirror. You make sure that you go at their speed, not your speed. I'll repeat that. You go at their speed, not your speed. And you go a chunk at a time. 40 words is what Marshall said. 40 words max. In other words, no long sentences, no long explanations. Slow down. Go 40 words max. So in communication, I was teaching this to um, medium security women in prison. And one of the women had an issue with another woman that was her cellmate. And so we were using this communication method. And what was happening is the person who was upset, Sally A., Cellmate A, cellmate B. So cellmate A said to the cellmate B, I'm, you know, we're locked up in prison. I have very little privacy. I really would appreciate it if you don't touch my stuff. It really bothers me. Can you tell me what you heard me say? That's what, so now think about it. What did Marshall say? The normal outcome of most communication is what? Misunderstanding. So this is pretty close to a direct quote. When she said to cell, cellmate B, what did you hear me say? Cellmate B said, yeah, you don't want me as a celly. Now, is that what she said? No, what she said is when you touch my stuff, it upsets me. I don't have any privacy. Could you not touch my stuff? But the problem is anytime we're communicating, it goes through this filter. So what it had to happen, and, it, and the more emotional it is, the shorter the sentences need to be. So narrowing it down to just like a sentence or two sentences at a time, if it's a really emotional thing, it took 10 times. How many times? It took 10 times for cellmate A to tell cellmate B before cellmate B got it. Is that because cellmate B is really stupid? No, she wasn't stupid. It's just very emotional. And she was very defensive. And so this is what's really important in relationship communication. The more emotional it is, the slower you need to go. Now, here's a, a third thing that I'm going to tell you. And I'm going through this kind of quickly. I want to give you the overview of what's going to happen. And we're going to dive deeper in it during the this six week program I started to tell people about, but I wanna give you something that you can use right now. So take responsibility 
there is a huge difference between a good teacher and a great teacher. So a good teacher, the students walk out of the room, they're going, oh my God, what a good teacher that was. A great teacher, they walk out of the room going, oh my God, I'm so excited about me and my life. A great teacher helps inspire you about you. And a good teacher, it's all about how good they are. So what has that got to do with this communication here? Well, what a good communicator does is they say, I said it right, you heard it wrong. And I don't even know if that's a good communicator, but that's one way of communicating. It seems like a lot of people are doing it well. It's not my fault they got triggered. I said it right. I did it. I didn't do anything wrong. But a great communicator takes, and I'm going to say this, this is something, and I want you to ask yourself, do you want to be a good communicator or a great one? So just put good or great there because it's a pain in the ass being a great one. It's, you know, being great at anything is hard work. So if you want to go from being a good communicator to being a great one, this one thing, this one thing, this one thing will make a huge difference. And what this is, is a great communicator really cares more about what the other person heard rather than what I said. So if I'm having a, an emotional and intense and important conversation with somebody, I will go and say, can you tell me what you heard me say? Oh, I thought I said, I love and respect you. And you heard that I, I, I don't care about you. Let me try again. No wonder you're upset. See, and I become responsible for what they heard rather than just what I said. It, is, it will transform your communication and you will be much more fun to communicate with and people will trust you. And the intimacy level will go up and the drama will go down. So it's just making sense. I see some hearts in there, some thumbs up. So take responsibility. So if you want to be heard, here are three things. Be purpose-driven. Go slow. By the way, part of the purpose-driven is to not use a bad, stupid wrong. Your purpose is connection and vulnerability and making clear requests. Go slow, 40 words max. And check in and take responsibility for what they heard. Oh, I was drawing on this and I thought you were looking at it. See, I was communicating clearly, but you couldn't see it. Anyway, back to purpose-driven, go slow, take responsibility. No bad, stupid, wrong. And when you start to communicate like that, you'll start to talk so that they want to listen, so that they want to hear you. How different would your relationships be if you were able to do that? Okay. Next one. And I would love to hear what you got from that talk. What are you taking away? Because it's like, it's decision point. I'm going to go back for a second. Of those three things, which one of them are you going to focus on? Because this call, this is different than some calls. This is not about information. Information is not going to get you anything. Transformation will. If you take what I'm teaching you and implement it, that's going to help you. If you just sit here and listen and don't do anything about it, that's not going to do anything. You can go online right now and type in relationship advice. Last time I checked, it was almost 96,800,000 hits. A lot of, there are tons of information. And so what? We've had miserable relationships just with information. So which of these three are you going to focus on this next week? Being purpose-driven, going slow, or taking responsibility and becoming a great communicator? So this is that part where you interact with me. All right. Moving on to the second part of this. So this, number one. This, number two. This, number three. All right. Uh, 
And some of you are typing in, and I'm not going to be able to see that until I go check the other sites, because this goes out on many different pages. It's not just on one page or one group. It goes out on several groups. So I can see there are different people there that are, want to be on the six weeks. And all right, here we go. How to listen so that they want to talk. So listening how they want to talk, what the whole idea here is, how do you create a safe space for communicating? Now, if I was giving you $100 bills, when would you want me to stop? So I'd love for you to type in the answer. If I'm giving you $100 bills and just flipping them up, you know, out there and giving you $100 bills, when would you want me to stop giving you $100 bills? So I know there's a little delay, but I'm waiting for some answers here. And the answer that most people give me, drum roll please, is never. Why wouldn't you want me to stop? Because when I'm giving you $100 bills, it's meeting your needs. It's something that you want. So when it's when we're talking or when our partners won't talk to us, why they won't talk to us is they're afraid of one thing. They're afraid it's not going to meet their needs because normally all of us love to be what? Heard, understood, and valued. So we love to talk. And the only time that we don't like to talk is when what we say gets used against us and whoops, to make us feel bad, stupid, wrong so the whole idea here start by creating a safe space in which to communicate the second thing we want to do is learn how to translate and what marshall taught and i'm calling it lol and it's not laughing out loud it's the language of love and the language of love is the language of feelings needs and requests Almost everything that we do is trying to get a precious need met. And so when we're communicating, we're making either implicit or explicit requests for intimacy, for connection, for to get our needs met. So the language of NVC, nonviolent communication, with the language of observations, feelings, needs and super important one requests that was the one that i had the biggest challenge with is ending on a clear request so it's hard to read that but that's what it is observation feelings needs requests and it's it's an ongoing practice to create a safe space so that your partner is willing to be vulnerable because if you want open and honest communication vulnerable or something like that i know they didn't spell it right so second thing translate the third thing tell me more rather than jumping in as soon as they're done because a lot of times and i know i had i had to work on it i still have to work on this it's like, as soon as somebody's done, I want to tell my story. And does that encourage other people to talk? No, it actually discourages them. So if you want to encourage somebody to talk, you feed back what you heard them say, you feed it back, you translate it into their observation, feelings, needs, and requests. So when you saw that, I'm wondering if you felt really frustrated and disappointed because your need for, well, if they saw a messy room, I wonder when you saw how messy the room was, it was frustrating for you because you have a need for organization and cleanliness. And I'm wondering if your request is, would you like to help in cleaning it up? Now, when you start to learn this way of communicating, you're going to go, that's not the way normal people communicate. Nope, not at all. Normal people com communicate in a way that 
destroys intimacy, reduces vulnerability, creates distance, creates the three R's, resistance, resentment, regret. So what I'm trying to do is teach you a way of communicating that creates connection, compassion, cooperation. So which one would you prefer? Connection, compassion, cooperation, or resistance, resentment, regret? Huh. So of those three, I would love to know which one do you want to focus on in the next week? Do you, and, and would you rather talk so that they want to listen or would you rather listen so that they want to talk? So if you could just type in listen or talk, tell me which one. That would be great. And if it's listen, do you want to practice creating a safe space, translating, or, or asking them to tell you more? Which one? So someone's there saying they want to practice listening. So when you're listening, which of these three are you going to focus on? Safe space, translate, or tell me more. And Every day for the next week, if you just say, all right, I'm going to focus on that, it will make a huge difference. Now, um, I know some of you have seen me do this before, and I'm going to ask you to do this. Now, this is not prayer. This is going to ask you to put your hands together like this. This is such an important concept in communication. I've taught this for probably 15 years, done the exact same exercise. I actually think I probably got it from Tony Robbins. I used to work for him years ago. So put your hands together like this. When I say go, go. Now really press hard with your right hand. Press hard. Now press harder. Press really harder. Now stop. Where are your hands? Now, most of you your hands are just like mine, right in front of you. What did I say? I said, press really hard with your right hand. What did your left hand do? Press back. Why? Did I say press with your left hand? No. But what happens is when we press with one hand, when we put use force, the other hand resists. So in communication, anytime that we start using force, what do we get? We get resistance. And the more force we use, the more resistance we get, and enough resistance, it's called war. And there's wars in the family, there's wars in the world, there's wars in government, there's wars on Facebook, you know, the, with the pandemic and the in, in, um, with immigration, with all sorts of different rules. It's like, wow. So if you, if you want to learn how to communicate better, Part of it's learning how to avoid using force. No BSW, no bad, stupid, wrong. Is that making sense? And I see, you know, some people are going to listen. Some people are going to create a safe space. And Todd says, I love the word request now being in our space. It has been a Big breakthrough. Thank you, Paul. And yeah, it, the word request, would you be willing to? Would you be willing to? It is such a profound and powerful word or a way of requesting. And and if it's a true request, you're, you're vulnerable. Now, there are five mistakes. I'm going to go over them really quickly today. If you're curious about them, you can find out more in my book. Um, and I love it if you buy my book. There's no doubt about it. It is, it took me, it's a small book. You see that? It took me about six months to write it, six years to edit it. And um, I'm dyslexic, grammatically impaired. You saw all my spelling errors. It's, <laughs> this is an act of love. Um, so you can get it on Amazon for $19.97, or you can wait till another like 10 minutes, and I'm going to tell you how you can get the, the link for free. And I'm going to tell you what the five mistakes are. But it's good to go through the book or go spend the six weeks with us and really practice 
avoiding them, ingraining, knowing when you're making those mistakes and stopping yourself and go, wait a second, I don't want to do that. I don't want to build a case against my partner or make a story or message to Zoom or cup stuff or do the fatal laps. So what I try to do is, and this is a, a great metaphor, is there was a book out that said, don't sweat the small stuff. And I argue with that. I I think what happens a lot of times is we ignore the small stuff and it becomes a big thing. So what I say is get it the acorns. Use these communication tools and get them while they're small. If an acorn falls on your roof, not a big deal. It's kind of, if we go back to that idea, it's safe to talk about acorns. It's not that safe when an oak lands on your house. If we wait too long, we end up with oak trees rather than acorns. So that's what we want to do is be able to get it while they're little and tame those triggers. Now, let me bounce all the way up. Uh, no, I'm not going to bounce. I'm going to go right back here. Sorry. I'm going to tell you how the brain works a little bit. This comes from the research that I, I was doing, and I studied a guy named Stan Patkin. And if you want another great book to read, read Wired for Love. And Stan talked about these three different levels. Now, I modified the levels a little bit, but they are pretty true to what he talks about. So attention, alarm, attack. Oh, and I don't have it up on the screen right here. Here they are. Your nervous system goes through three different phases here. So alert, you could be lying in bed at night and you hear a clunk. And alert is when you go, oh, should I pay attention here? Do I need to focus? So you go from drifting off to sleep paying attention listening for the sound is it a footstep is it danger is it you know what is it and at the house i live at we actually <laughs> in suburbia have chickens my roommate has chickens and it's awesome uh scott's chickens and recently there have been some raccoons so i'm on i'm sleeping but i'm on alert and if I hear something outside, I go up, I pay, I, my mind is paying attention here. So I pay attention. And now I move up to alarm. Now, when I'm in alarm, if I hear something rustling out by the chicken coop, it's like what I'm trying to find out is, is there danger? If there's danger, I move into the attack mode. If not, I pretty much go back to sleep. So first, pay attention. Is there something out there? Then is it dangerous? And here's where when we get in the attack mode, we're trying to look for enemy or ally. Whoops, ally. And where is it safe? Where is it dangerous? Where is the danger? I'm going to teach you something that's super advanced, and then I'm going to end it for the night. There's all those things that trip our triggers, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about this right here. When somebody is triggered, and how many of you have ever been triggered? I have a guilty as charged. When I am triggered, the more that somebody tries to convince me not to feel the way I'm feeling, the more that they seem like the enemy. So if you want to, to connect with someone who's in their reptile brain, don't try to use logic or reason. What you do is just ask them this super powerful question. Honey, what do you need to feel safe right now? What do you need to feel safe right now? Because their reptile brain is looking at you and asking a question. Are you enemy? or ally. And when you ask, and uh, what do they need to feel safe right now? You're putting yourself in the ally position. So you're an ally 
and you're trying to help them be safe. And what happens is that the reptile brain will start calming down almost immediately. There's lots of stories about it. I'm not going to go into any of them tonight. If you get a chance, come back, take a screenshot of this. These are five different questions you can ask that will help you when somebody's really triggered. So I'd love to hear what you've gotten so far. And oh, I'm going to give you this picture so you can. You get a chance, you can take a picture. That is basically of everything. And obviously, there's a lot more to go. But I want you to think about this. By the way, that that's Tony Robbins many years ago. That's me when I had hair. That's pretty entertaining. When I used to work for Tony. And I quote him all the time. And Tony was another person that was transformational in my life. I can look at my life before and after Tony Robbins. And one of the things he said, it's the way we communicate with others and with ourselves ultimately determines the quality of our life. So the quality of your communication determines the quality of your relationship. And when your communication falls apart, so does your relationship. So those are the five mistakes that are in the book. I am not going to go through that. These are some, and luckily, if you watch the replay, you can watch and read some of the different testimonials on my website, argueLessLoveMore.net. There is tons of testimonials of people that have used this method to transform your relationship. And I'll just read one. Paul gave us some simple tools to use the very first session, and we noticed a difference right away. Our relationship has never been better. Our only regret is we didn't find him 25 years ago. So if this is something that interests you and you want to know more, there is a way that you can get a copy of the book. But actually, what would be best, come spend six weeks weeks focused on this. And I'm going to be doing the six weeks to better communication. And that is going to be starting in January. And so I've already have like three or four couples that are interested and I'm looking for about 10 couples total. And if you want to do an application for it, I'm going to show you the link that you can fill out an application because I'm not taking everybody. You've got it. It's not, it's not for everybody. This is the beta test group and you have to be willing to, to be there for other people. This is not just about you getting your breakthrough, it's you helping other people get breakthroughs. All right. This is how you get a free copy of my book. You go to argueLessLoveMore.net forward slash free book. It's going to ask you to put in your name and email, and then it's going to email you a link where you can download it for free, a PDF. Now, if you want the hard copy or the paperback copy, go to Amazon, put in Argue Less, Love More. All right. Ah, I'm not going to talk about those things. I'm going to talk about this right here, and that's about it. We're about to wrap this up. So here we are, and I'm going to put this, by the way. This is if you're interested in t- in joining the six weeks to better communication, the communication challenge, go to argueLessLoveMore.com forward slash application and fill out an application and we'll set up a time and there's about two minutes worth of questions and then we'll talk and see if if you qualify and i'd love it if you'd qualify but you've got to be willing to be there not just for yourself but for other people too and be willing to do the work all right so here we go you've gone through this hopefully you've gotten something from it now what are you going to do about it One thing you can do is ignore and hope it goes away. Pretend that you don't have communication issues, and that tends to leave you in the area of relationship disaster. The next level up, which I have done, and almost everybody has done, they try to change their partner. They let their partner know how bad, stupid, and wrong they are and how much they should change and why it's their fault. 
And what does this get? This gets the three R's, resistance, resentment, regret. You can try to change yourself, but sometimes that's just doing the same thing to yourself, letting yourself know how bad, stupid, and wrong you are, that it's all your fault if I was only different. The next one up is when you're tired of fighting with your partner, you might trade your partner in and change partners. Yeah, and I went through one divorce, four broken engagements. So I did a lot of this. I did a lot of trading, changing partners. Now, the one I'm focused on and have been for a while is change the way I interact with my partner. If that's something you're interested in, come spend six weeks and it is going to be a breakthrough. What if you could say goodbye to the language barrier? Now, this is a translator. We don't have one of those, but I'm going to give you some communication tools that are almost as good as the translator. And it will be about rebuilding trust, rekindling intimacy, reawakening your love. And you're going to go through what we talked about today. Talk so that they listen, listen so they talk, avoid the issues, and bring back the love. Week one. Huh. And by the way, I'd love to hear what you're getting from this call so far, because some of you are not ready or interested in doing this course, and that is fine. It's not for everybody, and that's not always the purpose of the call. The call is to help give you information, and you can decide when and if this is for you. So this is what we're going to cover in the six weeks. Why communication so hard? What you can do about it? how to talk so your lover wants to listen. And we're going to go through the argue less, love more five-step method. And it's a foundation of that is what I learned from Marshall Rosenberg from NBC. That's the foundation. Week three, how to listen. And we're going to focus each week. There's going to be exercises. You're going to have a study buddy. You're going to practice. It is not just a heady thing. Week four, we're going to go through those five triggers, and you're going to start tracking your triggers. Which ones trip you up, and which ones do you do? And then what do you do when you get triggered or your partner gets triggered? How do you get back in the common communication again and bring back connection? And then week six, setting up that safe space for open, honest, vulnerable communication. This is an amazing set of tools. I love it that you're here. If you're if you're curious about it and want to know more, um, fill out an application. Let's see if you're a fit. I'd love to see if you qualify for that. All right. Thank you for your time and energy. If there's anything you got from today, put that in the, in the link. Um, and have an awesome day. And if there's somebody you know who could get something from today's call, you can tag them, or hashtag them or whatever in the comments and send them here and get the replay link. All right. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you and somewhere on one of these adventures. And have a great Thanksgiving, however you celebrate it, wherever you celebrate it. <sighs> I am not going to be doing this call next week on Thursday. This is, you know. <laughs> Probably the first Thursday, well, maybe the second Thursday since the pandemic started that I haven't done this call on a Thursday. So thank you. I'm sending you my love and blessings, you courageous souls. Ciao.